Hello and welcome. I'm Roger Ream, and this is the Liberty and Leadership Podcast, a conversation with TFAS alumni, supporters, faculty, and friends who are making a real impact in public policy, business, philanthropy, law, and journalism. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Bill McGurn. Bill is a member of the Wall Street Journal's editorial board and author of the Main Street column that appears every Tuesday in the Wall Street Journal. He was formerly the chief speechwriter in the Bush administration. Bill has dedicated his career to journalism and spent more than a decade reporting overseas, including an extended period in Hong Kong. He was the recipient of our 2022 Thomas L. Phillips Career Achievement Award. Bill, thanks for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our conversation, especially because I have such respect for you as a journalist and a person of great character. Uh, Thank you, Roger, very kind. Well, Bill, I'd I'd like to begin by asking you what led you into a career as a journalist? Um, I never really thought about it because it was something I always wanted. I always worked in my school papers, and that was true in college. So I, I never really considered anything else. And um, um, it's a very difficult career at some points, but it's very fulfilling. Yeah, well, your, your career has been uh, very, very successful. It, it's taken you to assignments both in Europe and Asia as well as here in the United States. What what led to those overseas assignments? Well, they were job offers and I needed a job. So uh, my first offer was to go to Europe. I did not want to go to Europe, uh, but that was a way to get to the Wall Street Journal. At the time, we had a European edition. And so I got to Brussels where we were located and, uh, and I had a good time. I traveled around on the company's dime and saw all sorts of things. Um, at the time, we also had an Asian edition, which was older than the European edition. Many of the people that I work with on Europe had come from the Asian edition to help start up the European venture. And I remember getting to Asia and think, uh, getting to Europe and thinking, this is as far as I go. Um, Hong Kong seemed on the other side of the world. Paul Jago was then in Hong Kong for the journal. Um, it just seemed, well, it was on the other side of the earth. Uh, and I, but two, three years later, I decided to give it a try and I loved it. I loved Asia. And of course, I, I lived there twice and the second time I was married. My kids are adopted from Asia. So it's been very good to me. When you were in Hong Kong, uh, you came to know Jimmy Lai, uh, you know, extremely successful entrepreneur and founder of a very successful newspaper, Apple, Apple Daily. Uh, he came to Hong Kong from China as a young man and uh, built a large, successful clothing chain and, and, and then went into the news business. How did your relationship with him come about? Well, it came about my second time in Asia when I was married. First time I lived in Hong Kong, I was single, and all I wanted to do was travel the region, right? And I did. Uh, The second time I was married, and uh, we grew more roots in Hong Kong just by having, you know, having a wife and friends uh, more rooted. Jimmy came into our orbit. I was then working at the Far Eastern Economic Review. Paul Jago also worked there earlier in his career. Dow Jones owned it. It was kind of like an economist for Asia. It no longer exists. English language, weekly magazine. So um, in Hong Kong, I noticed um, there were no stores for the middle class when, when I was first there. There were, you could get all the designers, Gucci, whatever design, Ralph Lauren, at great prices. So Europeans and Americans came over to get these expensive things at great prices. And all the hotels had these big name brand shops. And then for everyone else, uh, there were great bargains. Like you could get the, the sports coat you're wearing. You could go out and get that for five bucks maybe in the streets. The problem is you couldn't go out looking for a blue sports coat 
is kind of hit or miss what they have. So no one had come up with a way to tap the middle class, which wanted uh, value and style at a reasonable price. And, and then enter Jimmy Lai. He started a shop called Giordano. He named it after a pizza parlor in New York. Um, when he was working in New York, um, he went to it. He thought that an Italian name on a fashion item would be much better than a Chinese name, than Jimmy Lai. Um, and uh, so he named this thing and it sold, um, I don't like, kind of like um, the Gap or something. It sold polo shirts, brightly colored shorts, very good quality, very inexpensive. So, and there were branches all over. So you could go in and, you know, uh, someone who's a secretary or a housewife or a young worker could get some good clothes, stylish, at a very reasonable price. It was one of the first things to tap into Hong Kong's middle class. So at the review, I urged Gordon Krobitz, my boss then, uh, why don't we do a story on Jimmy Lai and this angle? And so they did. And then Gordon had lunch with him after. Gordon's like us. He believes all things we do and very free market. So Gordon came back from lunch. I didn't go. And he said, you know, Jimmy Lai claims to be the only man in Hong Kong who has read every word of Hayek. Um, and so my, uh, actually, he sent me a note that said that, but I couldn't read Gordon's handwriting. And I thought Hayek was Engels. And I thought, well, that's an achievement. Yeah, that's an achievement, but it's kind of like, those things you see in Chinese curiosity shops, like someone translated the Iliad into Chinese and wrote it on a piece of ivory the size of a thumbnail. It's an achievement, but you're kind of like, to what purpose? Then I found out it was Hayek. And um, I, I went to Jimmy's house. We went on a boat trip. We obviously had very simpatico feelings. And my wife became very good friends with his wife. And that's how our friendship kind of grew. Well, I, I certainly believe that story, not just because you told it, but in the film that the Acton Institute produced probably a dozen years ago, The Call of the Entrepreneur, they featured Jimmy among two other entrepreneurs. And he tells the story of coming to New York, his first trip, I think, out of Asia, and uh, someone he was with at dinner giving him a copy of The Road to Serfdom by yes. F.A. Hayek, the Nobel Prize winning economist. And when he tells that story about getting Hayek and how it changed his life, he, he's choked up telling the story. Yeah. So, no, he takes his, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Hayek too. And so is Gordon. Um, but, and in fact, before I left Hong Kong, my second time, I was in Beijing and our Beijing bureau chief told me, there's a conference going on and it's about a book written by this guy I never heard of, some Austrian guy named Hayek. And I said, really? And I went and I got a copy of the, uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. No, not Road to Serfdom. Constitution of Liberty have been translated into Chinese. And, um, you know, normally, like, the, the communists would translate things for the party leaders and say, this is poisonous stuff. You know, we got to keep out. It's really interesting because I don't think Hayek ever wrote a word about China per se. He was really concerned with um, socialism in Britain and how that led to a decline in freedom. Wrote a little about the Soviet Union. But the people living in a place like China under communist rule understood immediately the implications. Of course, Jimmy's now in prison and has been for about three years. Uh, I think he was sentenced to 69 months on, you know, who knows what kind of bogus charges, a lease violation or something. But he's more seriously, I guess, awaiting trial for national security law violations. And uh, you've been a not just a friend, but a vocal advocate for him. Uh, are you able to communicate with him at all or get you know, reports on how he's doing? 
you know, in my in my family, our families are like we're related. Oh, you should I'm talk. About, you should talk about. Yeah, you should talk about that. I'm his godfather. My wife is his daughter's godmother, and his wife is my middle daughter's godmother. So we're very entwined. Jimmy um, converted, became a Catholic uh, a week after Hong Kong was handed over to China, and. Um, so anyway, that that began the relationship. We're we're very close. I am able to write to him. I avoid all political topics. We write really about family and faith. It's it's rather amazing. I know this isn't about faith, but when he converted, uh, it happened so fast. Um, first, I asked his wife encouraged me to ask him if he wanted to become. A Catholic, because he um, he spoke so highly of it. She was. Uh, a lot of people in the movement were. And he said, no, turn me down. So, you know, you have to respect the man's wishes. Um, uh, but a week later, he changed his mind and said, I want to, um, I want Christ in my life. And he called the Cardinal and, uh, with, you know, he had to give him stuff to read. And uh, about two weeks later, a week after the handover, he converted. Now, I confess to a bad thought um, while it was happening. Um, I wondered how much Jimmy really believed uh, when he converted, because there were a lot of social reasons for him to become a Catholic. It would make his wife happy. A lot of the democracy movement um, was led by people he admired who were Catholic, um, he had great respect for the church, for re religion in general, for what it contributes to society. And he saw how China really lacked that, you know, private religious institutions, making life more civilized and, and, and fair and so forth. So I had all these feelings like how much does he really believe? I have to say I'm ashamed of them now because Jimmy's letters to me um, reveal a deep faith. And he's reading all the time. Cardinal Zen once complained, now when I go to Jimmy Lai in prison, he always visited in prison. He's, but he said, now when I go, I have to read up on Athanasius um, and Augustine and Aquinas because Jimmy has some question uh, about it. So um, so yes, I am able to commute, not talk, obviously. Yeah. Um but we do write. That must mean he does have access to books in prison. He does. Good. Um, Good. I don't know how it's really, he spends his free time uh, drawing, um, drawing, and he draws um, religious pictures, primarily the crucifixion. He thinks that's his calling now to be a religious painter. He, he's always had, he's always been involved in art, even before, I have a couple of things that he drew, but now he um, has drawn these religious things. So he's very interested. Yeah, and, and I think what people who may be not as familiar with his predicament in prison need to know is, you know, he, he is an extremely wealthy individual because of his successful entrepreneurship over the years. Uh, he no doubt could have gotten out of Hong Kong, uh, but he decided to stay. Uh, really because so many of the young people who took great risks to protest for China to uphold their agreement, their treaties, uh, who supported democracy, uh, were being punished for it. And Jimmy didn't want to abandon them. Isn't that right? That That's absolutely right, Roger. You put your um, finger on it. It's something I should clear up, too. Um, a lot of people think, a lot of people who know Jimmy's faith they think he's in prison because of his religion, that he's a religious prisoner. Um, not really, but it is fair to say he voluntarily went to prison because of his faith. You know, he, he, he believes in suffering, has a redemptive value, and he believes without a willingness to suffer, 
um, the stance he took would just be virtue signaling. So he had plenty of opportunities. He has a place in Tokyo, a place in Taiwan, a place in London, a place in Paris. He had plenty of places he could go to, but he 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 staked everything on going to prison um, because of his faith. Well, I'm I'm mindful of uh, something I once read of Solzhenitsyn serving in prison in in the gulag in the Soviet Union saying at writing at some point thank god for prison because yes. prison made him focus on really what was important in life I think Jimmy would say that too before he went to prison he did a podcast with Nathan Jaransky oh and it was really illuminating I bet. because um he he was very interested in how Sharansky survived in prison and Sharansky made clear, uh, you know, his faith. He, he at one point shared a cell with a Russian Orthodox priest. And they had different beliefs, but each would carry out readings and the other would listen. Um, and the two things were his faith and that Sharansky said, you know, having his wife be loyal to him, like Jimmy's wife. Because Sharansky said when the Soviets would try to demoralize them. They'd say, the world has forgotten about you. No one knows about you. No one cares what's happening to you. And he knew it was a lie because he knew his wife was out there caring for him, loving him, and making the case for him. And Jimmy picked up on that point. And when when he went to jail, Sharansky kind of said, he th- he got the sense Jimmy was preparing himself for prison, even when he was making this podcast. Yeah. Well, a, a colleague of yours at the Wall Street Journal, Evan Gersh, Gershkovitz, is in prison awaiting trial in Russia. His trial date, I know, had been recently delayed. Uh, it seems like threats to journalists from authoritarian uh, regimes, while they've always been a problem, seem particularly bad right now. There are some journalists in Iran that have been sentenced to prison for reporting. Uh, there's a report by Reporters Without Borders that con- the number of countries with serious violations of press freedoms has increased in the past year. Uh, my first question, I guess, is what can people listening to this podcast, for instance, do to help people like Jimmy and Evan know that they do care and that they, you know, I... I credit you. What you you spoke at an event of ours in October, and and you asked our audience to show their support for Jimmy with a, you know a very loud round of not only applause and but, Evan. but shouting, <laughs> yeah, and Evan, right? And I did the same at our journalism dinner in November in New York for Evan and Jimmy. But I, what what more can we do? I think the hope is that our political leaders will bring up their names all the time. For example, Jimmy, if a Chinese airline wants landing rights in Seattle, the answer should be, what about Jimmy Lai? Um, Actually, that's more for the British government since he's a full British citizen. With Evan, the same thing. Um, We have to press the government to make the case for them because the problem is, and it's bipartisan, um, an individual's case always seems secondary to national interests. You know, you have a trade deal, an arms deal, a security arrangement, and then to risk it for someone. But I think that's the promise of citizenship. You know, when you're in trouble and the only thing you got going for you is your government overseas, they got to really be there for you. I'll tell you, um, we went to Jimmy's uh, son's wedding in Taiwan a year ago. Me, my wife, and my oldest daughter. I came back to the U.S. because I can't visit Hong Kong. I know that. Um, might be arrested. Um, so it's, it's not safe for me to go. I never considered that my wife and daughter couldn't go. Remember, we used to live there mm-hmm. for many years. And... Um, they went to spend some time with Teresa Lai and uh, I had just got home at midnight and 
um, I got texts from my daughter saying they're at the Hong Kong airport and they've been detained by the authorities. So I was scared out of my wits. It's yeah. midnight. I just got in. I didn't know what to do. Fortunately, they 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 weren't officially detained. They were investigating. And uh, it was about six hours. And I alerted the consulate. Um, and they called the authorities just to say, we're watching this, you know. And um, anyway, after six hours, they said you could go in. But my wife recognized that if she tried to see Cardinal Zen or Jimmy, old family friends, we've seen many times over the years, it would be a trap probably and they get in trouble. So they left. But that's the kind of harassment today. And and poor Evan, he's a little different from Jimmy. And Jimmy, the, the authorities regard him as the mastermind of all the pro-democracy agitation. And uh, uh, they, they, the authorities really dislike him. Uh, so no doubt he's going to be convicted. His trial starts uh, December 18th. No doubt about the outcome. Um, Evan, I think, is just a pawn. He's in jail. He's just doing his job. He's not a spy. Nothing um, he's accused of is true. Um, and he's just a pawn in Putin's cold-blooded um, policies, you know, having an American hostage might be handy for him. Yeah, yeah. And I, I saw there was an offer, I guess, put on the table by the U.S. very recently that the Russians just rejected uh, for his release uh, and for some sort of exchange. But, uh, you know, the work of a journalist is is vital, and I admire what you do uh, and have done in your career. Uh, this year, we gave our Kenneth Y. Tomlinson Award for Courage in Journalism to Benjamin Hall at, mm -hmm. at News Corp, or at Fox News, rather, who uh, was badly injured in covering right. the war Right, paid a heavy train. price for his, his work. Yes, and uh, his book, uh, Saved, is just a it's superb account of uh, the ordeal he had trying to get not only in Ukraine, but about his whole career of what journalists go through to cover conflict and to get information to the rest of us that we need to hear about what's going on in the world. Uh, yet, of course, you know, authoritarians never want that information to get out uh, if it's in any way critical to them. Uh, do, you, do you see, uh, I mean, you, you've seen journalism change a lot in this country over the years, but where, where do you think we are in terms of you know, the state of journalism, either, in, you know, in the U.S. or globally? Well, I think it's always changing. Um, today, a lot of changes are technological. The fact that we're doing this podcast, that wouldn't exist yeah. 20 years ago. So, um, and the digital aspect means that whatever you do in whatever format can be transferred in seconds around the world. Um but I think a lot of it's still the old fashioned, find out what's happening, collect the news and so forth. I have to say uh, at your dinner, so many people came up to me and said, um, just want you to know my wife and I are praying for Jimmy Lai. I'll tell you, he's very humble. He's got thousands of people that he's never met, probably never will, who are praying for. Um, and I hear that all the time. I'm amazed at how many people do know about him. And that's largely because of the medium, social media, and so forth. So, um, you know, like the Hong Kong government has all these stories. On social media, though, they can be rebutted, you know, uh, and that's getting around. So um, his name is, is pretty wide. And so your group, Jimmy covers several categories there are people they they overlap but there are separate there are some people like you the anti-communist pro-freedom you know pro-democracy um that's one segment you were at the cato dinner because of hayek and and his personal friendship with milton friedman he took friedman into china on one of his trips uh, that's another sliver uh, uh, of people, the press freedom, you know, one of the things yeah. that's not appreciated, Jimmy had a 
newspaper, Apple Daily, that was reporting on Hong Kong in all the problems up till the very end. And uh, the very end was when the government took it from him without a court order or something. So press freedom people are, are interested too. As I say, there's overlaps between, I mean, I consider myself part of the camp of everyone. Yeah. Um, but it's a pretty wide variety of people to whom he represents freedom. And it, I say this also, not just as a friend of Jimmy Lai, even if I never knew him, I lived in Hong Kong 10 years. It's where I started my family. I had children. Um, it, it was a great place. It reeked of opportunity for ordinary people. And it showed what ordinary Chinese could do if they were given the freedom. Now it looks like that was a brief experiment of, you know, 150, 200 years, and it, it, it's vanishing. Um, the Hong Kong today is not the Hong Kong I remember. Yeah, we ran a program, a summer school in Hong Kong at the University of Hong Kong from uh, 2002 until I say the communists kicked us out, but went until uh, about what, 2018 or so. And then uh, it just became problematic uh, because of what was happening there. And we've we've pulled out of Hong Kong. But I just I fell in love with the place just on my short trips yes. over there. Uh, you're right. It was it was a land of opportunity and so many people in the old days, escaped from the mainland to to Hong Kong right. to fulfill it, their dreams. It's populated by refugees, yeah. you know, or children of refugees uh, coming from the turmoil of China. I knew a journalist there whose father, or, or a man whose father was a journalist during China's civil war between the communists and the KMT. And he covered um, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, moving of the gold from um, China to Taiwan. And he once said, Hong Kong is the only Chinese society um, that delivered something no Chinese society ever had before. Freedom from the midnight knock on the door. Um, Hong Kong was so peaceful. People, you know, if you were at a business, the secretaries at lunch, they're, they're, they're taking courses or planning to open their own shops. It was just amazing the, the power of, um, of that place, you know, and the peaceful nature of it. Um, and all that's been thrown out the window. You know, millions of people living on this uh, place with no natural resources really, except their right. human creativity and human ingenuity and the desire for human flourishing and they 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 were remarkably successful as the world's freest economy could you just i i, I want you to tell a quick story that comes out of your work as a speech writer for president george w bush but to do that i needed just to say something about w the person who really was a mastermind at hong kong success james copworth white uh, right could you just briefly share his role in this? Yes. First of all, I should say that most of Jimmy's friends, Paul Jago, I, we all have a, a, a bust of James Copperthwaite with his glasses like this and everything. Middle-aged guy, bald. And uh, he was Hong Kong's financial secretary after World War II and through the 60s. And Hong Kong wasn't a democracy, it was a colony. So he had immense power. But unlike most people with immense power, he used it to fight efforts to intervene in the economy. Um, he was brilliant, uh, that helped him. But um, I remember having a lunch with him many years later and asked him why he was famous. He wouldn't even let the government keep GDP statistics, right? So I asked him, why, why wouldn't you let them keep statistics? And he said, if I let them keep them, they can only misuse them. So he's a man after my heart. And he described meeting Milton Friedman in the 50s on one of Milton's first trips to Hong Kong. And Milton was so overcome 
by meeting a guy in authority who basically shared his beliefs about the economy. He described Milton almost like rubbing his hands in glee, having met Caperthwaite. And um, he had good reason to. Um, so a, a lot of us who admire Hong Kong look at um, Caperthwaite. Remember, at the time of Caperthwaite, the interventionist model was a dominant model. Japan, state capitalism, um, uh, Korea, uh, same thing. Uh, even Taiwan, not quite as bad, the more entrepreneurial activity, but still the state model of picking industries and favoring exports. And Hong Kong didn't have that, and it flowered. And you you took that bust of James Copperthwaite with you to the White House when you were speechwriter, yeah. right? <laughs> yes, I did. Um, That's a setup. I'm probably talking out of school, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, whenever you work for an administration, even if you love the guy you work for, there's always few things that you disagree with. Um, and I love George Bush. I thought it was a great president. But um, I would occasionally have to write speeches defending ethanol subsidies. <laughs> um, and to my great shame. And, you know, when you're a speechwriter, you owe it not only to do it, but to do it to the best you can, because that's what your employer deserves. And I did. I tried to do it to the best I can. But with one difference, I turned Cowperthwaite's face to the wall when I was writing on ethanol. <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're getting short on time, but let me just uh, ask you about more recent events uh, related, because you've written some really powerful columns recently about uh, the events of the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas, and in particular, the reaction on American college campuses to that, which we've all seen in the news. Uh, your column just about a week ago was Harvard's Hamas confusion, uh, which I thought was particularly good in terms of the moral clarity there. You know, what do you think has led to this sad state of affairs? Uh, obviously, as you touched on, we seem to lack university presidents with any kind of spine or courage to take the kinds of actions that are needed. But what are your thoughts about that? Some of which I know I you expressed. I think it's deeper than that. Um, I think the problem is like Harvard has as his motto, veritas, truth. And a lot of uh, colleges had variation. Yale, I think, has truth and light. And I think if you went on, and of course, the Declaration of Independence starts out, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Today, I think you'd find on campus the professors who actually believe in truths and believe that they're self-evident or could be discovered is very rare. And I think the fastest way to get a kid to no longer believe that there's an idea of truth that we can know it's to give them an elite Ivy education. And the other school started out, if you can't see a difference between people who get up in the morning and have planned to carry out killings of grandmas, mothers, and babies, and soldiers uh, fighting them, um, you know, what distinction can you make? Can you trust their judgment on anything? And um, like I regard Hamas and the terrorists as a collection of war criminals. They planned, a, this was not in the heat of battle where you might shoot up uh, innocent people. This is a planned war crime, living by people whose strategy is war crimes, um, placing themselves in hospitals and stuff so that civilians would have to be killed if anyone went after them. And that's, horrific enough, but the way so many people feel they can't condemn them, um, including like, well, President Obama did condemn them, but he went on to say, you know, basically what's truth is very complex. Um, no, it isn't complex. And I think these protests on campus, um, there are some areas where speech, some, there might be a fine point, but there's not an area... <coughs> if they're interfering with the university's life. It's amazing to me. They're not allowed to um, 
uh, forced Jewish students into a room, you know, while banging at them outside. Not allowed to harass a, a Jewish kid like they did at Harvard and block his way. Um, those should be easy calls. You should not be allowed to interfere in the life of the community or the university. And you should be dismissed if you are. And, uh, and I'm amazed and appalled that the universities can't make these fundamental distinctions. Well, it's been encouraging that uh, some of the large donors to these universities are waking up and demanding some changes uh, if they're going to, or they won't continue supporting them. It, it's a long time coming, but. Yeah, I think it's going to take a long time because there's also the money from the Middle East that I think dwarfs those donors. You know, they've, the Middle Eastern countries have realized like China, go to the campus, you can have a lot of influence. Um, and the faculty hires that have tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I also spec um, some of this to paraphrase my old boss is a soft bigotry of low standards. Um, I don't see many chemical engineers out there protesting, you know, um, I assume many of the degrees are easy courses and the professors teaching them. Again, I don't see the hard sciences overrepresented in the, these people. Well, th thank you very much, Bill, for joining Thanks, me. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. I appreciate all you do as a journalist. Uh, love your column every Tuesday and your appearances on the, uh, the, the wall street journals program on Saturday afternoons. Uh, Keep it going. We need people with your moral clarity speaking out on these issues and uh, offering insights. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very generous. We're big fans of um, the Fund for American Studies and um, keep up your work too. We'll do. And we'll do all we can to call attention to the plight of Jimmy Lai and Evan Gershkovich. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for listening to the Liberty and Leadership Podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, like, or share the show on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like this episode, I ask you to rate and review it. And if you have a comment or question for the show, please drop us an email at podcast at tfas.org. The Liberty and Leadership Podcast is produced at K Global Studios in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Roger Ream, and until next time, show courage in things large and small.